someone might have the capability and the opportunity to do something, but if they are not actually interested and they don't, their, their autonomous desire is not to do something uh, or any other element of it is not actually leading to them having the motivation, which doesn't mean like the group X instructor are yelling at you, but like the mm-hmm. motive to do something. I don't have a why. I don't want to do this. It doesn't matter, you know, what resources or ability you have to do something. You just won't do it. Welcome to the Wits and Weights podcast. I'm your host, Philip Pape, and this twice a week podcast is dedicated to helping you achieve physical self mastery by getting stronger, optimizing your nutrition, and upgrading your body composition. We'll uncover science backed strategies for movement, metabolism, muscle, and mindset with a skeptical eye on the fitness industry so you can look and feel your absolute best. Let's dive right in. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. I am beyond ecstatic to welcome the Dr. Eric Helms to the show today. Eric's work has been a huge influence on me in my personal journey and in my coaching education and philosophy. And today we're going to discuss evidence-based research, coaching, communication, what Eric's been up to in the world of powerlifting and bodybuilding. And we may dive into topics like self-determination theory, training strategies, plant versus animal protein, and adaptation during weight loss, among others. Eric is an accomplished coach, athlete, author, educator, specializing in natural bodybuilding and strength training. As a director and chief science officer of 3D Muscle Journey, Eric leads a team that provides evidence-based information, community support, and holistic coaching to drug-free strength and physique competitors. With an impressive educational background, including a PhD in strength and conditioning from Auckland University of Technology. He's published numerous peer-reviewed articles and co-authored The Muscle and Strength Pyramids, which uh, in my opinion are among the best training and nutrition guides out there. In fact, that's how I first learned about him about four years ago. But before discovering his other content, including a couple podcasts, 3D Muscle Journey and Iron Culture, and his work with Mass, Monthly Applications and Strength Sport, a monthly review of strength and physique training research. In addition to all of that, Eric has an impressive athletic career, having competed in natural bodybuilding, unequipped powerlifting, and Olympic lifting since the mid-2000s. Eric's definitely been through the trenches, and he's prepping for both a powerlifting meet and bodybuilding show this year. Eric, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the show. It's a pleasure to be on, and thank you for the very generous introduction. I appreciate it. No, absolutely. Well deserved. I, I was very excited for this. So were uh, my listeners. I, I'm going to sneak in some questions from them along the way. But for the for the two or three people listening <laughs> to this show who don't know who you are, uh, lay it on us. You know, we've given them the official introduction. So just tell us about what you've been up to lately in in the research and lifting communities. Yeah, like I said, I appreciate that introduction. So if anyone's not familiar with me, I guess a little more of a <laughs> A from the heart introduction of who is Eric Helms is uh, someone with an obsessive streak who got bit by the iron bug, uh, geez, close to 20 years ago now. I'm turning 40 this year, and I thought it'd be really cool to get back on stage. Um, This will be my fifth season, and I have always been just in love with the pursuit of strength as I have the uh, pursuit of the artistry of bodybuilding, which I, I really do see as an art and a sport. Um, I'm a competitive person. I like to compete. I want to see how far I can push myself, but I also really appreciate, uh, it as an art form. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun for me. I express myself through, uh, the pursuit of strength as well as bodybuilding. And I am currently, geez, what is it? It's May now. So I have a, a tentative powerlifting meet, which is about as hard as I'm going to commit, uh, in early July. Uh, I live here in New Zealand. You mentioned I got my PhD at the Auckland University of Technology. That's the uh, the biggest city in New Zealand and the North Island. I moved out here 10 years ago with my wife. I've been here since. Um, after I did my, my PhD, I just liked it so much they couldn't get rid of me. So now I'm a research fellow here and I have the, the privilege of mentoring um, master's and PhD students just like I used to be. And um, especially if they're down to, to do some muscle nerd research, then, then I'm their guy. So... Yeah, powerlifting meet coming up potentially. Um, the reason why I say it's potential is because um, I'm going to be dieting down. Oh, I am dieting down, so I'll be an 83 kilo lifter. I'm six foot for for reference versus versus yeah. maybe nine, 93. Yeah, okay, exactly. If yeah. you look at my my competition history, I've only done like two other meets way way back in the day at 83, and it was also during a a bodybuilding contest prep where I'm going to get that light anyway. Um, and yeah, so I'm also an M1, so a master's one lifter. So I'm 40. 
I'm 83 kilos. I'm trying to like basically cheat to be slightly better than I, <laughs> than I really am. You know? Yeah, yeah. 20 years, all these years of working hard and getting to this point, it's cheating. Yeah, no. exactly. It's 100%. <laughs> yeah. That's the way that works. Yeah. So. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So welcome to the Over 40 Club. You, you said you're turning 40, but I think it's already happened, hasn't it? It has. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, 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 and this, and then doing, well, okay. So back to something you mentioned, which I, I really liked is the artistry of bodybuilding and then the muscle nerd research. Maybe that's why I, I resonate with you. And a lot of other listeners do too, that just want to know as much as they can about this stuff. And I know you cover this on the Iron Cult, uh, Culture podcast, which I love. It's, I'll say it's not for everybody. And I say that in, in a good way because it's very unique uh, in the pantheon of, of fitness podcasts. It's, it's almost some, its own little beast out there. Um, but you seem to be balancing it all. And one of the things you just said is you're balancing two things this year. You're balancing powerlifting and bodybuilding. I know you said you're not 100% committed. We'll see what happens, I guess, in a few months, right, when you get there. But how do you manage them both? I know you've done like whole podcasts on this, but just at a high level, people listening mm -hmm. want to excel in both sports. And yet the muscle and strength pyramids distinctly talk about strength and hypertrophy and different programming. So how do you balance those? Yeah, it is. Um, I think probably the best way to put it is uh, you need to understand what the minimum effective dose is for you to Im improve it both. Um, and that's a really interesting concept that we often don't explore uh, in sports science because sports science is often all about getting the maximum out of yourself because it's competitive. It's sport, right? Um, health science, however, I would argue should definitely always be focused on the minimum effective dose, like, uh, committing to a lifestyle of exercise and nutrition is very challenging. So what's, what's the amount that we need to move the needle in terms of health. And, um, so anyway, that rather unexplored perspective in sports science has been explored more and more. My good colleague, um, affectionately called Dr. Pack, but his full name is, uh, Dr. Patrick Close Enderlachus Korakakis. Um, he is, of course, of Greek descent and a proud Greek man and an awesome researcher. He's in Solent University uh, with Dr. James Steele, who's a, just, uh, in my opinion, a, a legend of, of meta science and pushing sports science forward. And anyway, they've collaborated over the years, and he did his entire PhD looking at what's the least amount powerlifters need to do to get meaningfully stronger. And it's a lot less than the average uh, powerlifter probably thinks. Um, which speaks to the kind of the diminishing returns of doing a ton of volume. It's not that it's not worth it, but, you know, if we were to look at some of the meta analyses on, uh, say, what does it take to get the highest effect size of improving your one RM strength, there's data that indicate doing one to four sets is 80, 85 ish percent as good as doing, say, five to 12 sets per week on average. For someone, you're not an average, you're, you know, an individual, so your mileage may vary, but. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of give you the idea that there might be someone out there who does just as well on three sets of squats per week if it's pretty specific training compared to 10. So you've uh, you know tripled your, your volume and then some, and you're not getting much more out of it. So that kind of perspective helps you program for these things. Because the biggest issue with training for strength and hypertrophy is not that they're conflicting goals. It's the opportunity cost. Uh, it's not like getting stronger at a, a squat makes your quads smaller. Mm -hmm. um, which it, some people talk that way, like, like it does. Uh, but if anything, if you take any high level power lifter and you were to diet them down, they'd probably look the part of a bodybuilder just because squats, bench, deadlift, and the accessories cover a lot of ground. Um, however, it, it is very challenging to really get the most out of yourself and balance the two. And, uh, if you can know, what does it take for me to move the needle on one? And that's kind of like my minimum baseline and you, distribute that in an effective way across your, your, your training split. Then you see kind of what juice do you have left? Uh, hmm. you know, what, what, what's left in the tank for me to distribute? And then what choices do I make? What is already taken care of with my strength training? And then how do I distribute, um, what's, what's needed for my individual physique? So I'm a little lucky in a way in that my lower body seems to respond quite readily to training and my upper body seems to require a little more volume. Um, and also that I'm a lot more resilient to benching a lot in terms of injury, aches and pains, and strength and recovery than squat and deadlift. I'm not unique in that way, but I probably am a little unique in that I don't require a ton of leg training. So I can do a fair amount of, of squats and bench and deadlift, and then really I just need to get some calf training in. 
mm-hmm. and maybe a, a couple Don't sets of like extensions, <laughs> leg curls, right? You know. So wait, hold, hold on, real quick on the bench thing. So you said you're both resilient to that amount of volume, and you need it, which is the, yeah. is a nice combination. Which I, I know people have shoulder issues. That's a very, very other than low back. That seems mm-hmm. to be the most common thing. So if you needed the volume and you couldn't, then that that could be a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah. Absolutely. This is not necessarily an option for everybody, you know, so you sometimes have to get very creative. Uh, You might have to do, you know, partial training. You might have to figure out what movements that are not actually the competition lifts transfer the most that Mm. you can do. Um, And I've been in that position in the past with prior injury and it's, it's not fun. Um, And I can deal with it when I need to, but at the moment I'm healthy and it's just more of a, a matter of balancing, uh, you know, fatigue and, and, and soreness and, and, and like, you know, like elbow tendonitis, but nothing real major that can oh, yeah. really take, you know, take me and put me on the sidelines. Yeah. So, okay. There's a number of concepts here. They're all, they're all great concepts. And I want to, I want to come out with strategies or actions that people can take from this. So you talked about minimum, minimum effective dose versus, you know, maxing out all the time. You also gave some examples like the, uh, the minimum amount of sets that you need to get most of the results, kind of the 80, 20 rule or 85%, which is a common theme in this, in this world, it, it seems, which purport which comports with reality i mean you you talk about um protein in the same way you know do we really need to get x grams per per kilogram when this this can do it because you're going to sacrifice other things um is this is this a concept that a new lifter should be very concerned about or is this more for an advanced training hey listeners this is philip pape and i'm excited to announce our upcoming totally free 21 day challenge starting December 1st. It's called the Wits and Weights No Diet Holiday Body Recomp Challenge. This challenge is about learning how to achieve body recomposition that's building muscle and losing fat at the same time without dieting or restriction throughout the holidays. I'll be giving you free videos, guides, and personalized coaching in a private group chat to help you enjoy the holidays while being satisfied and guilt free. The kickoff call is Friday, November 17, and the link to enroll is in the show notes. No matter what episode you are listening to, don't worry. If you're hearing this after November 17, you can still register and get access to the replay and resources before the challenge starts on December 1st. Again, to join the Wits and Weights No Diet Holiday Body Recomp Challenge to build muscle and lose fat without dieting through the holidays, click the link in my show notes. Now back to the episode. It depends on the context, really. I think um, new lifters, the most important thing is developing a a good, consistent set of habits Mm -hmm. and uh, supporting adherence, which is ultimately the most important thing. Um, And unfortunately, you don't have to look very far to find people who are extremely motivated and then kind of get burned out and stop lifting only a few years later. And they were all about that life, you know? And sometimes it's because... I, I always like to use the analogy of the uh, the person who came on a little too strong in a relationship, mm-hmm. you know, like you love lifting. That's great. But you got to wait a day to call them, you know, give them some space. They need to adapt their life. Um, you don't tell them you love them on the first date, that kind of thing. So, yeah, and go they, watch Swingers if you're not familiar with this concept, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, which uh, I hope your audience is, is in the same age bracket as we are, or they're they're not going to even know exactly. who those people. Well, they know the people are because they're famous now, but they won't. Know I, sell, I self movie. select my audience with these things. Okay, my man, <laughs> I can That's get into eighties gaming culture. Uh, gaming culture too if you want. <laughs> I'm not mad about that, dude. Yeah. So uh, as as a Street Fighter two player, I mean, Tekken's yeah. 90, 93. <laughs> but anyway, the uh, yeah. The, the, so I think one perspective is that a novice only needs so much to progress. So most people who really get bit by the iron bug are doing two to three times the amount of training they can benefit from. Um, There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it probably would make more sense to focus on, you know, a good three sessions on the fundamentals and, you know, give yourself a little more time to recover and, you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder kind of thing. And just set up a consistent set of habits rather than just jumping in, full bore immediately at, and, and then as you need it titrating up the the volume or the total stress of your training to mm. continue, continue to progress so that's kind of my perspective on on how beginners should, should take it 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you're either doing too much, you know, when you get really into you're doing too much, maybe too many days, too many sets, um, trying to do too much, you know, hypertrophy or direct work when maybe you just need the, the big lifts. How do you reconcile that with, in fact, just today, I think the I think Stronger by Science sent out a, a, I don't know if it was associated with mass, but the study about um, how people may not be training hard enough, right? Like in in terms of either going to failure or just um, volume. So how do you reconcile those two concepts? Because there are people that think they're they're doing something that's effective and they're not training hard enough. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's an interesting interplay with uh, effort, if you will, Mm -hmm. and uh, and volume that's pretty important. Like... um, all of the research we have on specifically hypertrophy and the amount of sets that are probably appropriate at a broad population level, they're meta-analyzed, which just means they're uh, studies of studies. So someone has taken all the various studies on saying, hey, how much muscle can you grow by doing X number of sets versus X number of sets? And go, okay, we got 20 of those studies. Let's put them all together and see if we can get a better estimate with a more uh, robust sample size. And, um, you know, that's been done a number of times. There's the, the classic one that's probably most well known, known by Schoenfeld. Uh, that's Brad Schoenfeld, who's done a lot of the research we have on hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. And then there was one in the last couple of years uh, that was done by Bas Val, which kind of explores some of the higher volumes. And when you look at the two, you see a pretty clear relationship where it's not a one-to-one improvement. You know, you do get more bang for your buck, per se, in your first few sets. But uh, there is a more notable increase in... Uh, hypertrophy when you add more volume than there is in strength because it makes kind of sense strength is a specific skill you can only go get get so much of that um and hypertrophy is more of a physiological adaptation but anyway so when you when you look at this research um you have to keep in mind that the vast majority of the studies that have been meta-analyzed they are observed training studies where researchers are in the lab motivating the individuals and encouraging them to go to various forms of of failure. And I say various forms because there are various forms. Either the participant thinks they've reached failure or the the researcher thinks, okay, that, you know, that bar slowed down enough. I think you're at failure. Uh, Or they actually make them go to the point where they miss a rep. So that describes 95% of the studies that have been meta-analyzed. So that means that our our understanding of volume is with the assumption Hmm. of there being sufficient effort. Now, the data we have on failure is a whole nother kettle of fish, and it suggests that you don't need to go to failure to get the benefits, but you need to be reasonably close to failure. Um, you can't be you know, six, seven reps short all the time and expect to get the same kind of gains you would be if you were two, three, or maybe even four reps short. But therefore, it is an issue if someone is doing what they think is an appropriate amount of volume, but they don't know that they're not training nearly hard enough. However, I think for novices, this is actually less of a problem uh, than than it might necessarily be, so long as they have a mind towards progressive overload, which yeah. is such a critical concept. Because if, if they are, you know, doing, you know, a five by five with their 12 rep max initially, you know, you're like, oh my God, that's seven reps of failure. That's never going to work. Well, guess what? The heaviest squat they ever did was getting off the toilet last week. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like, so putting you know, is 60 kilos on their back or 135 pounds, even though they're a 200 pound person and they could squat that for 12 reps and only doing sets of five is absolutely progressive overload compared to what they've done. And it will be a sufficient stimulus to give them gains. And as they get more acclimated to the weights, uh, and if they hopefully get feedback from either a, you know, a trusted workout partner or eventually a coach or just, you know, throwing out a video on or on a Reddit forum being like, Hey, how's my form? People are going to be like, you know, what, what did you think your proximity to failure was? Oh, uh, you know, I think I had another couple. And like, like, try seven. And like, oh, really? <laughs> you know, so I think so long as you don't let your ego get in the way um, and as you get a little more integrated into the culture, which I think is an important part of any pursuit, um, then it, it typically takes care of itself. Um, and some of the research we have on people who are just probably, quote unquote, not training hard enough is kind of just like a random selection of people at the gym. It's not necessarily mm. when we're looking at, uh, you know, well-trained lifters. And in fact, when we look at well-trained lifters, uh, they're actually very accurate at estimating their proximity to failure, which you can experimentally do. Um, and when you meta-analyze that, see, this is why I talked about meta-analyses. There's a, a great meta-analysis by Halpern and colleagues which suggests that on average, uh, in the studies where we've looked at how accurate are people gauging their proximity to failure, with a fair number of them being on trained lifters, 
uh, while there's a wide point estimate, on average, it's being one rep off. So the average person who lifts is probably doing fairly well in their estimations of proximity to failure, certainly well enough to be, um, you know, making their volume matter. Yeah. And I think uh, that you had a lot of great concepts here for the newer lifter as they're getting into what you call the culture, right? That eventually it's going to work out. And I experienced this myself. A lot of people struggle even knowing what to do, right? And, and listening to folks like you and understanding the research, but basically just getting out there and finding a program and doing it, right? Because adherence is number one. And then building over time, whatever that is, you, like you said, it, it, you may have uh, seven RIR. And then as you add, if you do sets across and then you add weight, it's going to catch up to where you need to be and you're really going to push yourself. Um, the getting ingrained in the culture, I think, is is a good segue into self-determination theory because one mm -hmm. of the elements of that you talked about recently with your friend Omar on Iron Culture. I just love that show, man, is uh, is relatedness. And you talked about self-determination theory, the idea that three, three aspects, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, right? So autonomy being, you know, having agency and then competence, competence building skill and then relatedness, having some sort of community or like you said, culture, and then having this athlete-centered approach if you're a coach to help someone develop that and increase self-esteem. You also talked about how we could use that ourselves as sort of a checklist. You talked about the combi model. I'm not going to get into all the details. If you want to learn the details, folks, go, uh, go check out Iron Culture. But putting it all together, it seems that we're not talking about so much about a specific program or a specific you know, style of lifting. We're really talking about mindset and agency and self-determination, right? So mm -hmm. these are valuable things. Challenging people, giving them knowledge, giving them agency, um, where am I going with this? I, I guess I'm looking for you to elaborate a bit on that topic in the context of maybe some stories that you've had or athletes you've worked with and share strategies the listener can use to take action in that context. Yeah, I think um, what might be useful just because I'm kind of mm -hmm. often positioned as the science guy is to talk about how sometimes when we get a little too rigid with our perspective on evidence-based practice mm. and a little too dogmatic and maybe a little too prescriptive um, and feeling like, you know, if there's a study on something, you know, therefore it's actually a commandment of what we must do now in what can sometimes turn people off is that when they're doing something that they like, that they've set out, they've written down, maybe it's not perfect per the PubMed guidelines right now, but it is sufficient. It covers the big rocks, uh, you know, and they're told, don't do that, do this. You should expect, based upon our understanding of human motivation, that their knee-jerk reaction will be various shades of go F yourself, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> depending upon how nice they are. Uh, because what you're essentially doing is subverting what we understand from the evidence, ironically, about human nature and human motivation. And you're telling someone, uh, you know, you, you don't get to decide what, what you do for yourself, you know. So, and that may not be your intention. It probably is not. But I think when I have been in a coaching position or in a science communication position, I've not always been super aware of this. And I've tried to be more aware of it that I'm essentially, you know, throwing a threat towards someone's autonomy. Um, it's kind of like, you know, you know, you're supposed to clean your room, but you get told to clean your room. And now you're like, well, I don't want to clean my room now. You know, it's things you otherwise might even want to do. Uh bother you when when someone else is trying to impose what feels like their will on what things that you would do anyway. And this is something I think we can all relate to. And it's kind of the quote unquote trick of therapy. Um, if you talk to therapists, the reason why they ask questions and they probe deeper and they don't just tell you you're in an abusive relationship, you should probably leave this person is because that's far less effective than you realizing and saying to yourself, I'm in an abusive relationship. I should probably leave this person. Same message, two very different things. And you can't have a realization for someone else, but you absolutely can assist them and share your perspective so that they might be able to get there faster or get there at all. And that's ultimately what the role of a coach is. And I think scientists in an applied field like sports science or health science or exercise science or nutrition science would do very well to understand this very basic concept of the way people operate, because then they can help get someone towards a more effective approach, which will, you know, get them better progress, potentially enhance adherence, make them happier, make them more resilient to injury, and maybe less likely to make errors, quit, get, give up, or get frustrated without actually making a threat to their autonomy. 
So the idea of autonomy supported coaching is exactly that. It's the idea that it's not about you as the coach. Yes, they hired you. Yes, you're the expert. But that doesn't mean that you are a dictator or or authoritarian who just tells the person what to do. And a lot of the times you take a collaborative stance. You might make a suggestion. Uh, You might ask for permission even to make a suggestion. And if there's a given, you know, program that you've been following or the person has been doing with success, and then you go from there. Okay. The cops weren't there for me. We're good. Um, so a lot of the autonomy supported coaching or, uh, what you might call person centered, athlete centered or client centered coaching is based around that principle. Mm -hmm. It's intertwined with other things like, you know, motivational interviewing and other skills that you can build around that. Um, and it's not that it's like all of a sudden your, your, your bachelor's degree in exercise science doesn't matter, or your certification Mm -hmm. is not important, but it's really just more about how you get to delivering that information. And it's not something that's just trying to avoid a negative. My experience has been that it's actually a positive, that when you communicate with people in this way, they get far more excited, far more invested. They're more likely to train hard, not miss sessions. And they're more likely to communicate with you and give you information because they know that's their role rather than being told, I am a cog in a wheel or I'm the soldier, you're the captain, you know, I'll drink blood, you know, tell me, tell me whatever mm-hmm. you do, coach, right. you know, like. We, we think that's a good thing, like the good soldier, but ultimately the, the only access we have to how is that athlete adapting, you know, what's their, their mental outlook on this? What do they think? Is it working? Cause we're not there in the kitchen with them. Even if we're there in person, we're only there with three hours, you know, a week on average as a personal trainer, uh, with someone, uh, out of the 24 times seven hours they have in a week, the best access we have to their experience is them telling us that. And if they're not taught that that's an important part of the relationship with the trainer, uh, especially if it's an online trainer who's not even getting those in-person hours, it's just a weekly report and maybe a video and hopefully sometimes some Skype calls or, or, or whatever video platform is your preference. Uh, the window into their insight, you know, we can make up a lot of things in our head that's incorrect, but they can tell us a lot. And that's really where we get all our information. Yeah. So one thing I got out of that is never, never coach your wife because a lot of these, uh, a lot of these tips are very much uh, relationship uh, advice as well. But anyway, regarding training, how how do you deal with someone if if you have a client who is the type that says, just tell me what to do, tell me what to do, I'll do it. And and I think I hear a lot of you know athletes who've just been around, you know, been around the block for years, and now they they kind of know what to do and they want the guidelines and the. Uh, recommendations. How how would you respond to that? Are you trying to help educate them on this motivational research and enlighten them as to how this relationship can be even more fruitful using this or what's your approach? Yeah, a little bit of both. So, I mean, one thing is they're being very clear with what they want. Mm -hmm. They don't want to sit here and and, and tell you a whole bunch of shit. Just give me what you think's best. Which is agency. Yes. Of a kind. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I've I've hired you to tell me what to do. So, Mm quit fucking around and telling me about this foo-foo stuff and, and tell me what to do, right? <laughs> and I think you do have to meet them there. Yeah. I think some of the things that you need to do as a coach is essentially going very kind of, you know, straightforward if that's the way the athlete's kind of delivering that. Uh, it's like, yeah, cool. Well, I need to know X, Y, and Z so I can tell you what to do, you know? And then, you know, they'll respond to that in kind. Like, so uh, I need to know, I need you to give me a, like a rating of perceived exertion on the whole session on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Wednesday is supposed to be an easier session to so recover before Friday. But hey, if, you're, if your RPE is, is similar to day one and three or higher, then that's an issue. I need to know that and we need to change the program. You know, let me know how, how the body's holding up when we do this kind of volume. Uh, so you need to have give them clear and not kind of these open-ended things, but give them mm-hmm. clear things. And I, I want X, Y, and Z from you on these days in this way. And then you know, I think you do educate them a little bit. You explain to them that the best tool I have to know how you're recovering is what you tell me. My best understanding of your motivation levels is what you tell me. Um, you can absolutely ask them, hey, like, what are your goals? Where do we, where do we want to get to? And uh, even ask some whys. Oh, goodness. You know, I, I think they'll be okay. Sure. So, yeah, I think getting them to open up to you to the, the degree that they're willing. And if if they if they kind of start with, hey, like, coach, tell me what to do. I want to know what to do. And I've hired you as a consultant kind of deal. Give me the guidelines. Then that's great. You just need to always frame things through that. So that's the lens you take and you go, okay, for me to do that, I need X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And then I think you'll, you'll find that relationship works quite well. And yeah, you, 
so the athletes will tell you what they want in almost all cases, even when what they want is not to, to tell you much, but they might not know what that actually looks like in, on the other side of it because they aren't you, right? So they've never been on the other side of a coaching. Well, not, that's not true. Many times they haven't been on the other side of a coaching mm-hmm. relationship. So being able to uh, communicate to them your needs is pretty important in, in all uh, coaching relationships. And framing it in such a way that these are my needs so that I can be of service to you in the most effective right. way possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Hi, my name is Lisa, and I'd like to give a big shout out to my nutrition coach, Philip Pate. With his coaching, I have lost 17 pounds. He helped me identify the reason that I wanted to lose weight. And it's very simple, longevity. I want to be healthy, active, and independent until the day I die. He introduced me to this wonderful little app called Macro Factor. I got that part of my nutrition figured out. Along with that is the movement part of nutrition. There's a plan to it, and he really helped me with that. The other thing he helped me with was knowing that I need to get a lot of steps in. So the more steps you have, the higher your expenditure is and the easier it is to lose weight. When it's presented to you like he presents it, it makes even more sense. And the other thing that he had was a hunker guide and that really helped me. So thank you, Philip. What about on the other side where somebody doesn't have a coach and it's a, it's a, a challenge of motivation, I guess, right? And we throw that word around a lot, but you did talk about this combi model, the capability, opportunity, mm-hmm. and motivation driving behavior and using that as a checklist, even for yourself. So how can someone do that? Someone listening who's like, I don't know, I don't want to work with a coach, can't afford a coach. I just want to do it myself and learn to lift and, and make progress, but I'm not motivated. Yeah. So first, I just want to say that absolutely, you could make this thing work without a coach. And mm-hmm. when we think about self-determination theory, you know, there's relatedness doesn't need to be a coach. It just means that part of a community feeling like you're understood, being acknowledged, kind of no person's an island, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of respect to the, the psychology there. You like that? No, no, it's and, very and, important. The community is important. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Is. I agree. It is. The yada, yada, yada didn't quite give it the, yeah. the, the, the gravity that good. I intended. <laughs> um, competence is essentially feeling like you're getting better at something over time. Like when we get frustrated is when we feel like we're putting forth effort, but nothing's changing, right? Um, and that makes you want to quit. So you can very clearly see how that's a threat to uh, to sticking with something. And then finally, autonomy, that the goals you're pursuing are your own. And none of that requires having a coach. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can use that as a checklist. And then also, like you introduced, uh, another really cool model uh, that is often used in understanding the pursuit of health behaviors or not the pursuit of health behaviors or the cessation of, of health behaviors is the combi model, like you said. And that is exactly what you said, competence, which lines up very much with the SDT model. Opportunity, which I think is very complementary to the uh, self, the SDT model, uh, self-determination theory, is understanding that, yeah, like if you want to have a community, but you live in a very remote area and you don't have an internet uh, access mm. or don't have, you know, like, or you're really not good with, with, with technology, you don't have the opportunity to develop relatedness very, very easily, right? Or if you want to, you know, I watched the documentary or the, I'd say the, the, uh, the, the real life Hollywood story of the, the Williams sisters and their father uh, coaching them. Oh, yeah. Like if you want to get into tennis, but you live in, uh, you know, a, a, like an inner city when you don't have a lot of money, that's going to be harder to do than, than if you live in the suburbs, right? So those types of things, it, 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 it helps explain some of the realities related to self-determination theory. So you can self-identify those things. A coach should also pay attention to those things. So capability, opportunity, and the M, which I'm blanking on at the moment. Motivation. Motivation. Thank you. Which is why I forgot it because it's at the core center of SDT. Yeah. <laughs> it's SDT explains all of that. Um, so that's where they link to. So when you look at the con B model, someone might have the capability and the opportunity to do something, but if they are not actually interested and in, they don't, their, their autonomous de- desire is not to do something uh, or any other element of it is not actually leading to them having the motivation, which doesn't mean like the group X instructor yelling at you, but like the mm-hmm. motive to do something. I don't have a why. I don't want to do this. It doesn't matter, you know, what resources or ability you have to do something. You just won't do it. Uh, I think back to when I was running track in high school, I just did not like running the 400 meter, even though I was reasonably good at it. And I made up a, a pretty solid four by four team. And I just did it because I didn't want to let the team down. 
But as right. soon as I get out of high school, I never run a 400 meter again. Boom. You know? Right. So you're talking about an incentive. So if you're a professional athlete, your incentive might be millions of dollars. And if you, like you said, you, yeah. Okay. Well, interestingly right. enough, the strongest incentive is actually not the pay, although mm-hmm. I've never been paid a million dollars to do anything. <laughs> Um, so that may, may, may change my perspective on this theoretical construct. It's actually intrinsic motivation. You know, mm-hmm. um, I would say that competing in bodybuilding is a lot harder than running the 400 meters, even though the running the 400 meters is very hard. Um, but because I have a strong intrinsic drive to do it and I get something out of it, I will keep doing it. Um, and it's extrinsic motivators are at best things that support that or add on to it or is the cherry on top of the cake. But at worst, when they supplant that, when you start doing it purely for the win, for the trophy, or for the million dollars, you find yourself just feeling like, I just don't have the same drive. It's not like it used to be. I'm doing this like a job. It feels like a job now. Yep. And um, that's something you want to avoid at all costs. Mm-hmm. And it is easy um, with the reward structure of sport um, when competitive desire sometimes supplant our initial process-oriented drive uh, for those things to get subverted. So it actually takes effort. And uh, in purposeful thought to hold on to an intrinsic drive to do something while you're also pursuing extrinsic outcomes. Um, an easy example is the athlete who has their best showing ever or best performance ever, but places lower just because the field was more challenging, but they feel like a failure. You know, they did everything right. And if they were not competing and they were just going to the gym and looking at their logbook, they were like, I crushed it. But because they got ranked, you know, that whole comparison is the thief of joy that actually turned it on its head and now they they mm. not as motivated to do what they love doing which can be can be tragic if it leads to burnout but uh being able to hold those two things appreciate the progress you've made uh the place where you're at your commitment to something and have the pursuit of excellence but then also have a competitive goal and outcome and say hey i want to do better where am i at realistically is is, is hard and a coach can also help with that um, so to answer your question, the combi model is great. You can assess the opportunity. Uh, you can assess the motivation and that kicks you back up to SDT. It's like a flow chart. And then you can also assess, you know, competence or capability, which are kind of mm-hmm. one and the same. And that creates this ecosystem. If you're self-coached of where am I at and what do I need to work on? What do I need to identify? What resources do I need to connect myself with? And another piece that's not connected to any of this, but just advice I have for self-coached individuals is report into yourself. It's going to feel weird, but um, get a spreadsheet, have a plan, and then record a message as if you had a coach on a weekly or biweekly basis. Uh, Or write an email and you can even send it to yourself. And, And this is something that makes sense if you have coached before. If you're just an athlete, this is going to sound weird. But for someone who has used this coaching model for others, it puts you in a certain frame of mind. And allows you to be a little more objective. You go, okay, what would I do with this person if their name was not Eric Helms? And they said they did X, Y, and Z. And you can be more objective about what might be the best decision. So it's kind of like a little Jedi mind trick on yourself to be the same type of coach you can be for others for yourself, which is generally quite hard because you're so emotionally close to uh, the decisions you're making. And you have to have the knowledge and uh, tools like you're sharing here to even know to do that. But I do have a friend who uh, kind of has a ranking system for multiple areas of his life, you know, relationships, fitness, and so on, and kind of coaches himself and then reports out onto it, to it with a, a group of, of, of other men that he talks to. So that's kind of the relatedness part. Um, mm. So you had me at flow chart, you had me at Jedi mind trick. Now I'm wondering, <laughs> Eric, your personal routine, like how do you right now, what is the the big motivator for you? Is it the competition? Is it yourself um what is it yeah i'm um i'm very solid in 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 what i'm about and my best guess at my future it's very hard to predict who i will be at 65 but having been doing this for now my first comp- competitive season was 07 in bodybuilding and 06 in powerlifting and i started lifting in 04 so i'm coming up on two decades of lifting mm-hmm. and loving it and having that relationship change and my meaning and wise change and becoming more aware I think I'm pretty bought in intrinsically, and I don't think that's going to change. Uh, I suspect I will be getting on stage as an M1 competitor, but also M2 and M3 in the future, and just doing it to see being the best version of myself at any given time. And that makes sense to me, and I look forward to it. But because of that, I'm allowing myself to to lean a little more into my competitive side. So one of my my goals, uh, not my main goal, but one of the goals I have this year is to try to get my WNBF Pro card. And something that wasn't a goal in prior years, 
but it's been something I've thought about for a long time. My first introduction to natural bodybuilding was I was a test judge at a show in 2006 that was a WMBF show. And it was my first time I learned like, oh, natural bodybuilding is a thing. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I want to compete in this. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, Rodney Hilaire's show in Georgia when my wife was still stationed in the Air Force. Rodney Hilaire is a multiple time uh, late 90s, early 2000s WMBF uh, pro champ in the heavyweight division, won world titles in the heavyweight class. And, um, and yeah, in Augusta, Georgia, uh, or, or, or Macon or around the area. I can't remember exactly where he had the show and I got to see these competitors. And ever since then, I've like, oh, so a good goal would be to get my WNBF pro card, mm-hmm. which is probably at this stage in natural bodybuilding, the hardest professional status to get. And, you know, I haven't got it yet. I've gotten pro qualified in smaller organ- a smaller organization back in my third season. So it's something that means a lot to me. And, um, and then in turn with that, then competing as a pro at the highest stage worlds is kind of like, those are my, my final bosses that might change. Like if I do decently well at worlds as a pro and I'm like, Hmm, let's see how far I can take this. You know, like I'm, I'll, I'll go wherever my body will let me go. But I am noticing that the gains are coming harder and harder to come by <laughs> at this stage, which I don't think is an age thing, but I think it is, I have been lifting for 20 years thing and I may be closer to the ceiling than I'd like to admit. Yeah, no, uh, I would love to be there someday. Fortunately, fortunately for me, I started lifting about three years ago, and still a lot on the the table to to go after. As are a lot of my listeners who who want to understand how to do that. How to, so you've been doing it for this many years. First, first question is: Would you go back and tell your younger self to do it differently? And then, second, what is right now? Having written the muscle and strength pyramids and all these different ways to program, and everybody's individual, different levels of volume. Still, what are the principles and the bedrock of just the basic programming for a new lifter who actually does want to prioritize both strength and size? Mm, Yeah. So the first thing, what would I tell myself is that um, just because you've never been injured and you've never been a a little overweight doesn't mean they can't happen, you young, skinny person. (laughs) Um, And perhaps plan for those things. But you you don't know what you don't know. Because I did have a fair number of lower back injuries just from kind of not thinking about what I was doing in my lifting early on, which sat me out a good bit. And then after my first season, I didn't think at all about there being any, like I figured I would, I'm really, really hungry. That's fine. I'll eat a lot and I'll get back to my off season weight and that's it. But I actually gained like 44 pounds in, in three months. Uh, and then spent most of my next off season, like dieting off that after dieting, which is less than ideal. So anyway, you know, just uh, kind of tell tell me some things that are coming down the bend. Like around that corner, there be monsters was essentially what I would tell myself. And then I'd let the rest sort it out because I, I kind of like where I'm at. But I wouldn't have minded not getting – I don't know. It's tough to say. Like I don't think 3D muscle journey would be is, around yeah. Yeah. if I didn't have those things. But you, have, you had to have all those experiences, yeah. yeah. I did, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you take that for what it's worth. You know, it's it's funny you say that because I, I can relate to it a little bit because when I when I started lifting and a lot of it was based on your stuff and reading, you know, and, and Andy Morgan, right, who you co-wrote the author with and or, or co-wrote those with, and uh, I kind of neglected the nutri- nutrition half of that, mm. <laughs> and also gained quite a bit of weight on I don't know whole milk and whatever I wanted to eat, you know, to to, but but you, unless you go through that process, you don't realize that on one hand it it, it does help with the lifts, and on the other hand, well, now you need to learn about nutrition. <laughs> Yeah. Having the experience I had with uh, nutrition and being someone who grew up skinny and never even thought about it. I just ate, Mm. you know, it's like whatever. The first time having body image dissatisfaction and feeling like I wasn't in control of my own eating, it gave me a window into something that a lot of people deal with in our our society, unfortunately, and which gave me the drive to then learn more about it. And now a significant chunk of what I do as a researcher and a significant part of my part of my writing is... uh, you know, talking about what has sometimes been considered the elephant in the room in the bodybuilding community, which is, uh, you know, body image dissatisfaction mm-hmm. and disordered eating patterns, if not full blown eating disorders. And that's a common thing in sport, especially weight class restricted sport and physique sport, even more so. Um, so, you know, helping people kind of recapture some of that control in a healthy way is, uh, is, is, is what I do. So anyway, bit of an aside. So your second question, if I, if I remember it correctly was, what are some of my basic advice for early stage or late stage novices, early stage intermediates? They want to pursue both strength and hypertrophy. Yes. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, the first thing I would, I would advise is, um, do, do some work to figure out what your minimum effective dose is. Um, 
some of the research we have would suggest it is probably, you know, one to five hard sets that are specific on the lifts you care about for getting stronger. And um, that's easily work into, workable into a, uh, a program, English. Um, and the way I'm currently doing it could be somewhat of a model where one to three times per week on the squat, the bench, and the deadlift, I'm working up to a heavy single. So this is a single I probably couldn't do a second rep with, but that I don't feel so unsure of that I need a spotter. Um, if your experience level is not such where you can be that precise, get a spotter or just be a little bit lighter. The heaviest you're comfortable without a spotter, it's certainly going to be sufficiently heavy enough to drive strength. So this would be, this would be like a, a 90%, 90, maybe 95%. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the thing is for, for folks who've only been at it a couple of years, just do this, doing this will change what that number is sometimes mm -hmm. even week yep. to week. Okay. If you're used sure. to doing say five or something like that, the reason why the minimum effect of a dose can be quite effective is because the specific stimulus is a more potent stimulus, right? So you might find yourself starting to do these singles and every week you can add five pounds to, and have it be the same feeling of the same percentage, which is a good thing. It means you're getting stronger. So yeah, I, I, I would typically recommend you can do that. And then for, for your back off work, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same movement. So you could do a single at, at a squat and then move on to a leg press for your back off work. If you happen to be well built for a squat, you could then move into your hypertrophy work. So these, these top singles are a really useful tool to get good at the skill of the lift. And then to actually do the hypertrophy work, you can do movements that are a little more suited towards bodybuilding. Um, not that the deadlift, the squat and the bench aren't great builders mm -hmm. of muscle is that they also tend to come with, you know, costs associated with them. Um, yeah, they're more stressful, uh, mentally, it's harder to work up to a heavy set of five on, on, on a squat than it is on a leg press for most people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if, if you want to have a, if you want to modulate your stress down mental or physical, or if you have joint pain where you can only do so much volume on a thing, like you brought up earlier, shoulders and bench press, this gives you a lot of flexibility. You know, you can do your top single on bench, shoulders start to get a little niggly. You're like, that's good. I'm going to move over and do some, some cable flies or something like that. So this is a really yeah. good concept to sit with. Cause I hear it all the time and I'm always talking to all my 40 something friends, you know, we have the little uh, aches and pains from lifting. These are really good concepts. You know, one being top set back offset, right? The other being going to a, a support, a supportive or accessory movement rather than overstressing on, on, on the max reps for that first movement. Um, good, really good advice there. Just wanted to, to sit with that and let people soak it in. Absolutely. Okay. And the kind of the way I see it is for strength specifically, there's a hierarchy of, of what is like useful, productive time. And the specific movement itself, you know, without any other context <laughs> is your best bet at, at improving that specific movement. But there are costs associated with it. You can only do so much of it, especially at that heavy load. And then from there, you kind of, you can, it's useful to have schema for what are the different exercises for. So a common mistake you see is someone in a strength phase, oh, they're going to do tricep pushdowns. They're doing heavy sets of six to eight. And like, well, I'm in the strength phase, so all my movements, I'm just doing lower rep. That, that's a reasonable thing to do. But then you have to think, okay, well, why am I doing a tricep pushdown? It's probably not for direct transfer of strength to a bench press, right? I mean, bench press, you're lying down on your back. You've got a bar in your hands. You're trying to be tight and arch a little bit. A tricep pushdown, you're standing up. It's a cable. Your hands are way closer together. It's a single joint movement. There's no coordination with your, your shoulders and chest. You know, you're stabilizing yourself, but standing. So there's going to be next to zero transfer of actual skill. The reason we're doing a tricep pushdown is because we're trying to increase the cross-sectional area of our triceps so that there's more contractile tissue so that when we bench, we're probably able to produce more force. So it's, this is the mm -hmm. long game, mm -hmm. right? So what's the best rep range for you to do a tricep pushdown is the real question. And if six to eight bothers your elbow, but I got to do it because I'm in a strength phase, nah, mm. shut up, do 15 to 20 reps. That's fine, you know, because we know from the data on hypertrophy, that so long as the effort is there, approximate failure, if you will, that, you know, moderate reps or high reps are going to be roughly equivalent on a set to set basis for most people. Your mileage may vary, but I wouldn't start with the assumption that you're a, you know, a special snowflake who responds better to high reps than low reps or vice versa. Unless you have good personal data, you, you're most likely to be someone who, is going to get the same bang for your buck if the RIR is similar uh, when you're doing 12s or 6s, right? So that's one thing to consider, that the movements that are there 
to produce hypertrophy, hypertrophy will help strength, but they don't need to be done in such a specific narrow confines that you typically see in some of the quote unquote power building programs. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's that's good as that's good as well. And even alternating between those rep ranges to take the stress off, right? And mm-hmm. and, and rotating. So that that's all really good. Before I know we only have 10 minutes left, so I wanted to get to like one or two other topics real quick. Let's do it. And the nutrition, we covered nutrition a little bit. There's a friend of mine, he's a fellow coach. Shout out to Dustin Lambert for this one. There's kind of, I don't know if it's a debate or just, um, you know, as always, there's there's camps with different things when it comes to plant versus animal protein uh, and whether one is whether one is more beneficial than the other. And of course, you have to look at the context and the goal, right? Is you, are we talking body composition? Are we talking strength, um, cardiovascular health, uh, hypertrophy, and so on? So you can cherry pick Made analysis like there was one I found by Lim et al. 2021 that showed a slight benefit for animal protein for lean mass accretion, but no difference in strength. Anyway, that's just one of many. So, what does the evidence tell us about the differences between animal and plant protein in terms of outcomes, not just proxy measures, which is another thorny area, right? But, but real human outcomes. Is, is there a rule of thumb that works for most people? Like, you know, get a certain amount of grams of protein from plants for overall health and nutrients. And the rest from whatever you want, or you know, what are your thoughts on this? I like how you just framed that there at the end, because in reality, we don't eat mm. animal and plant proteins; we eat animals and plants, right? Mm. And it's very difficult in these analyses to tease out whether it is the food that contains the amino acids, or whether it is uh, and, and the nutrients associated with those foods, uh, or whether it is the specific you know, like, like amino acid in them. And I can tell you that when it comes down to a very reductionist take on protein, it shouldn't make any difference at a certain, with certain caveats. So the reductionist view of why animal proteins are typically better or, or animal sourced proteins are typically better than plant sourced is because they generally have a more complementary essential amino acid profile. They have higher amounts of leucine. They're not quote unquote missing or low in any specific uh, essential amino acid. So this is a random example, pea protein, very robust in uh, branched chain amino acids, high leucine content, relatively comparable to whey. But if I recall correctly, it's relatively low in methionine, which is one of the other essential amino acids. So it's a problem, mm-hmm. right? Um, but again, we don't eat proteins, we eat foods. Mm-hmm. So it is very rare that you will find a vegetarian or a vegan who has a pea protein shake post-workout, but then doesn't have any other protein sources right. of any meaningful amount or a sufficient amount of protein by the end of the day. So that shortfall of, of methionine is not a problem when they're also having rice and beans, chickpeas, uh, and all the other foods that they're consuming in a day. Um, so you could ask the question, all right, well, if these various different plant-based proteins are, you know, you know, not, not that high in, in, in certain essential amino acids, does that mean that the overall quality is lower? And you could probably make a mechanistic argument like you alluded to that, yeah, when we compare like just the protein quality, you generally see a hierarchy, not always, but generally where uh, plant-based proteins are a little lower in terms of their amino acid composition and digestibility scores compared to um, animal proteins. But the differences are not as extreme as most people think. And we're extremely efficient at extracting everything out of the food we eat. And most importantly is when you look at applied outcomes, is that when you're consuming the ranges of protein that we recommend for sport, a decent kind of threshold of where you start to maximize the benefits of protein is right around, say, 0.7 gram per pound or 1.6 grams per kilogram. Uh, We actually have studies now on vegans lifting weights compared to omnivores where they're consuming at least this amount. And in the periods of time studied, you know, your typical training study, 6 to 12 weeks, we don't see any significant difference between groups. And now that that's kind of like addressing the typical argument against like, you know, the vegan protein and the thing, oh, you need to eat a little more or something like that. The argument for is generally, hey, you know, we look at these studies on vegetarians and vegans, population level, if we cherry pick certain meta analyses and hey, these vegetarian or vegan diets look healthier. They seem to have better health outcomes than omnivorous diets that include meat. But when you start to control for a lot of the confounders uh, and the covariates, which it's really difficult to do because you don't get to really experimentally control these things. So there's observational research, which is highly valuable, but it has some limitations. You start to see that the, the picture that get, gets painted is that vegetarians in general are more health conscious people. If they're adopting a specific way of eating, 
they're less likely to smoke, they're less likely to drink, they're more likely to be active. And when you control for those factors, all cause mortality starts to be very similar. So when you have comparable omnivores and comparable vegetarians, like you specifically look at omnivores who exercise, don't smoke, don't drink, a lot of those things go away. And I think the best overall big picture interpretation of the data we have is that a plant-based diet is beneficial for you rather than an omnivorous diet being automatically a negative for you. That's not to say there aren't some things in some omnivorous diets that have maybe a negative signal in the noise. Like if you were to eat a whole lot of processed meats or like charred food uh, or trans fats or a very high, a diet, very high in saturated fats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, you could run into some, some problems that would be of course, greatly mitigated by the fact that you're exercising and doing all those other things that I discussed, but there's no reason you can't do those things and also be an omnivore. Like I'd be hard pressed to, to see how a, a, you know, like a pescatarian wouldn't be in as good or a better position than, than a vegan. You know, because you've kind of avoided all, all of those things, but then you've gone, oh, you know, the, the, and the protein quality might be a little higher on average. And they're also getting probably more DHA and EPA in their diet. So, you know, if, if we really wanted to kind of play like the health Olympics, you start splitting hairs. But at that point, once you start to kind of play the health Olympics, we are talking about so small of differences that they don't matter in the long run. And you've ticked all the boxes. So, so long as you're consuming complementary proteins as, as a vegan throughout the course of the day, not necessarily the same meal, and you're hitting that threshold of protein intake and you are lifting weights, you're probably good to go. And likewise, if you have a omnivorous diet, but it's heavily plant-based, you're probably good to go. Yeah. And, and that's a good one. That was actually the one I was really getting at was the idea that a lot of omnivores don't eat very many plants. Let's just be honest. And so this could be a little bit of an incentive to say, well, you know, getting some some of your protein from your plants gets you to eat more plants. Um, anyway, well, th- Phillip, this is great. I, I have yeah. One recommendation yeah. for everyone yeah. is go to Omar Yusuf's YouTube channel. Yeah. And I want you to watch any video you want and then just scroll to the last 30 seconds and take that message to heart. That's all I have to say. Okay. <laughs> he says, eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, eat your effing vegetables, the end of every single video. That's so. right. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Omar is great. Yeah. If, if I have you on again, we have to dig into iron culture stuff because I got so, so many questions there. I'm trying to get him on the show and uh, I don't know, maybe you can, can give him a little nudge. Um. <laughs> oh, man, good luck. O- o- Omar and podcast. There's, there's one podcast he does. Yeah, I got it. I even so. wore a, a shirt from his company, you know, send him a video, but you know. Um, oh, man. So... Yeah. Where was like, Oh, and, and then the confounders, that's another thing you mentioned. Cause the, like when you look at diet soda studies or seed oil studies, you have that similar thing where if you separate out people who have overall healthy dietary patterns, even though they consume those things, they tend to be just fine. And you kind of have to, to separate that. All right. I know you have to go. I have one second to last question before, uh, before I go. And that is what one question did you wish I had asked you? And what is your answer? Oh man, that, that's a tough one. I think you did a really good job and you asked me a lot of good questions. Honestly, there you did a good job and like we, we you kept it high level like you mentioned off camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, you touched on self-determination theory, people who are coached and not coached, which I think was great. You asked me what I would have done different. And when we talked about vegetarian stuff, we, we, we got to both sides of the coin. So honestly, I'm, I'm going to be that, that like shitty host who, who, or guest who doesn't tell the host anything useful for that question. I think you did a really good job. I love I it. No, that, that's, 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 uh, that's a, um, a compliment. So I appreciate it. That's fine. So that, where can listeners learn more about you, Eric? Yeah. For, so first, just thank you for having me on, Philip. It's been great. This was a, a lovely discussion. If people want to learn more about what I do, the good one-stop shop is 3dmusclejourney.com. That is the number three the letter D, then Muscle Journey. From there, you can find links to a lot of the things you talked about in the intro. Uh, my books, The Muscle and Strength Pyramids. My monthly research review for people who want to not just nerd out once in my books, but stay up to date with the monthly nerding. That's myself, Lauren Colenzo Semple, Dr. Mike Zerdos, as well as uh, Dr. Eric Trexler. And we review research that comes out on a monthly basis relevant to building your, your strength or you know manipulating your physique. We really enjoy that. And then the only other things that aren't linked through the various things you can click on at 3dmusclejourney.com is iron culture which you uh you know have talked about so generously which which i appreciate and if you want to find all the appearances i do off of my own platforms like this lovely podcast follow me at helms 3dmj on instagram where i share all the stuff that i do like that and on that note philip when you've got any media related to this share it with me i'd be more than happy to post 
will do. So I'll put all those links in there. If people want to know whether they should chill their hands before they lift, that's one of the, the questions that are answered in the latest uh, mass review. And uh, man, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, thanks for having this conversation. And I know the listeners will get a ton of value for this, Eric. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. If you've been inspired by today's interview and are ready to take action and build momentum on your health and fitness journey, just schedule a free 30-minute nutrition momentum call with me using the link in my show notes. I promise not to sell or pitch you on anything, but I will help you gain some perspective and guidance so we can get you on the right track toward looking and feeling your best.